Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, we are revisiting the battle between the Ryzen 7 1800X and Core i7 7700K. Now, before we get too far into it, a couple of things I should just explain. I'm using the 1800X and not the cheaper 1700 because, well, realistically, I could only pick one Ryzen 7 processor for this comparison due to the time investment, and the 95 watt TDP 1800X is a better Ryzen 7 representative, I feel, especially if I could only pick one. Now, to be completely clear, upon release, the 1800X did carry an MSRP of $500 US, making it considerably more expensive than the Core i7 7700K, which was priced at $340 US. This made the Ryzen 7 1700 the more direct competitor, as it was priced at just $330 US. But it wasn't long before AMD started executing price cuts, and the 1800X dropped down to roughly match the Core i7 processor. For example, the 1800X dropped down to just $320 US on Newegg in the same year of its release, and has since dropped as low as $220 US at the same online retailer. So since I'm overclocking both the Core i7 and Ryzen 7 processors in this video, I will be showing out of the box performance as well, but there'll also be overclocking results. And since the Ryzen 7 1700 typically hits four gigahertz as well, uh, it'll deliver the exact same overclock performance that you'll see from the 1800X in this video. I'm about to quickly go over the test system specs, then we'll jump into the benchmarks. But before that, meet ASRock's new flagship Z390 motherboard, the Phantom Gaming X. It's packed with loads of upgrades, including a 600 amp capacity 12 phase V core VRM, 2.5 gigabit LAN with an additional 2 gigabit LAN connectors, Wi Fi 6, Creative Sound Blaster Cinema 5, loads of USB 3.2 ports, SATA ports, and M.2 Ultra ports. There's also a number of really nice design elements such as integrated IO shield, stainless steel PCIe covers, a massive heatsink for cooling the M.2 drives, a metal backplate, and much, much more. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Now, for memory, I've ummed and art about using expensive low latency Samsung B-Dye stuff for these CPU reviews, but after much consideration, I've decided that I will use G-Skills Flarex DDR4 3200CL14 memory, and that is of course high quality Samsung B-Dye stuff, and I'm gonna use this for a few reasons. Firstly, these aren't budget processors, so spending a bit of extra money on memory isn't out of the question. And secondly, we're testing CPU gaming performance with an RTX 2080 Ti to remove any GPU bottlenecks. So why do that and then risk limiting performance using slower system memory? So that's my reasoning there. Uh, really shouldn't bother you too much one way or the other, as long as both CPUs were tested with the exact same memory. In total, nine games have been tested at two resolutions, along with a few application benchmarks, so let's get into it. Starting off this benchmark session, we have Cinebench R20, and Cinebench has always been good at showing the two tails of Ryzen. Here we have the multi-threaded performance, and despite a rather large clock speed deficit, we see Ryzen has no trouble stepping all over the Core i7 processor. Out of the box, the 8-core processor is 55% faster, and that's obviously very impressive, though it does of course have 100% more cores. Still, when fully utilized, it's clear the 7700K is no match for the 1800X. But here's the other side of this story, the single core performance. Here the 7700K is 22% faster out of the box and also went overclocked. This gives the Intel CPU a significant advantage in lightly threaded workloads, workloads that don't max out the Core i7 processor. WinRAR, for example, is more about memory bandwidth and latency than it is about cores, and as a result, the 7700K is around 8% faster in this particular workload. Certainly not a massive difference, but given what we saw in the Cinebench R20 multi-core test, it's probably not the result you would have expected. Moving on, we have a benchmark that's of particular importance to me, as I use Premiere Pro on an almost daily basis. Please note that Loa is better here, and we're looking at the time it takes to encode our hardware unbox videos at 4K using the H.264 format. Here we see that the 1800X is 43% faster, taking just 508 seconds out of the box. So for content creators, the 8-core CPU is the obvious choice and it really was a godsend for creators at the time. Likewise, the 1800X was welcomed with open arms by 3D modeling professionals. Here we see when using the latest version of V-Ray that the 1800X is 57% faster than the 7700K out of the box and 50% faster once both CPUs are overclocked. We see a similar story with Corona. Here the 1800X was again 57% faster out of the box, completing the task in just 131 seconds. 
Now, the last application benchmark that we're going to look at is Blender. And here, the 1800X was 62% faster and 60% faster once overclocked. So obviously a massive advantage here for the Ryzen processor. Just quickly, when running the Blender workload, I also measured the total system consumption. And here, the Ryzen 7 1800X only pushed total power draw 26% higher. Not bad, given we saw around a 60% increase in performance. Overclocking, though, kind of blows Ryzen's efficiency out of the window. And frankly, the 32% increase in system power draw isn't worth the minor increase in performance. Okay, time for some games. First up, we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and here the 7700K was 5% faster on average and 8% faster for the 1% low result. And we see that the margins remained fairly similar once overclocked. As you'd expect, moving to 1440p does reduce the margin as we become slightly more GPU limited, and once overclocked, both CPUs were able to max out the RTX 2080 Ti. It's also worth noting that we're not using the highest quality preset in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, so it is possible to make the game much more GPU bound without a resolution increase. The Battlefield 5 results are quite interesting. Here the 7700K is maxed out, and while it does do much better than the 7600K, you can see the 1% low is down on the 1800X, which enjoys considerably more breathing room. So in this instance, the average frame rate can be quite misleading as the 1800X definitely provides the smoother experience in this title. Even at 1440p, the 7700K is still getting maxed out and as such provides a noticeably worse experience when compared to the 1800X. Of course, the game is still very playable on the 7700K, but given the choice of these two processors for Battlefield 5, I'm confident most gamers would choose the 1800X. Here we see the 7700K makes out rather well in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and this is entirely down to its hyper-threading support. Previously, when we tested the 7600K, it really struggled in this title and was noticeably slower than the R5-1600. The 7700K didn't exactly blow the 1800X away, and both did deliver smooth, very playable performance, but overall the Core i7 processor was faster by a reasonable 11% margin. Jumping to 1440p does cut that performance margin down quite considerably, but the 7700K was still faster, this time by a 6% margin when comparing the average frame rate. The Division 2 is another title where the 7600K struggled, but here we see with the aid of hyper-threading, the 7700K makes out just fine and is quite a bit faster than the 1800X when comparing the 1% low performance. We see that the 1800X does come back quite a bit at the more GPU-limited 1440p resolution. That said, the 7700K was still around 11% faster when comparing the 1% low results. Once again, we see that it's Far Cry where the Ryzen CPUs really struggle. Here, the 7700K was a whopping 24% faster out of the box and 31% faster once overclocked. The Ryzen 7 processor was able to keep frame rates above 60 FPS at all times, and the gaming experience was nice and smooth, but the 7700K was just a lot better overall. Even at 1440p, we see that for high refresh rate gaming in Far Cry New Dawn, the 7700K is just a much better processor for the job. This time overclocked, it was 35% faster, and that is a truly massive difference for the CPU to make at 1440p, even with an RTX 2080 Ti. The Ryzen processor also loses out in World War Z, but this loss is less significant as both CPUs allowed the RTX 2080 Ti to render over 130 FPS at all times. Still, if it's more power you seek, then the 7700K can push around 14% more frames. Naturally, the margins are reduced at 1440p, and here the 7700K was up to 8% faster. Needless to say, both CPUs enabled an excellent gaming experience. Like World War Z, Rage 2 isn't a very CPU demanding title, and here the 7700K and 1800X provided the same average frame rate data. That said, the higher clocked 7700K did sustain a higher 1% low result, offering around 12% more performance here. The margin is reduced to basically nothing at 1440p, and it's fair to say both CPUs provided the same gaming experience. The first gen Ryzen CPUs don't do that well in Hitman 2, and you'll see a rather significant improvement in performance, especially for the 1% low result when moving to a second gen Ryzen part, such as the 2700X. Again, the 1800X did enable very playable, very smooth performance, but the 7700K did the same with around 18 to 20% more frames. Even at 1440p, we still appear to be largely CPU bound, and as a result, the 7700K does provide a slightly better gaming experience. Last up, we have Total War 
three kingdoms, and here both CPUs achieve a similar average frame rate, but the higher core count 1800X does provide a noticeably better 1% low performance. This is also seen at 1440p when comparing out of the box performance, but we see that the 4.8 GHz overclock does get the 7700K up to speed. So, it seems for modern games, the Core i7-7700K and Ryzen 7 1800X are quite evenly matched. There are still some newer, but still lightly threaded games where the 7700K enjoys a rather significant frame rate advantage, but in all of those titles, the 1800X still provided smooth, playable performance. On the other side of that though, in the more demanding titles where we saw the 7700K starting to get, well, pretty well tapped out, uh, the 1% low performance did suffer. And honestly, this situation isn't that dissimilar to what I found in our day one review two years ago now. It's just more pronounced now. And before I continue, here is a direct quote from the conclusion of my now two-year-old day one Ryzen 7 review. One thing I did notice is that all games that I've looked at so far, which is considerably more than the four shown here, were smooth on the Ryzen processors. GDA5, for example, plays really well on the Core i7 7700K, but every now and then a small stutter can be noticed, while the 1800X runs as smooth as silk, sand stuttering from what I've observed. I found a similar situation when testing Battlefield 1. Performance was smooth with the Ryzen processors, while every now and then the quad-core 7700K had a small hiccup. These were rare, but it was something I didn't notice when using the 1800X and 1700X. But as smooth as the experience was, it doesn't change the fact that gamers running a high refresh rate monitor may be better served by the higher clocked Core i7, 6700K or 7700K. While the gaming results might not be as strong as what we had hoped for, they are highly competitive and that should hold particularly true for the Ryzen 5 and 3 series. It's also worth noting that we are testing extreme gaming performance here with a Titan XP at 1080p. Ryzen looks more competitive at 1440p and certainly so when paired with the GTX 1070 or Fury X. For the most part, I'd say that conclusion is still accurate today, though I'd certainly never recommend the 7700K over any Ryzen 7 part in 2019, uh, even if it was the same price. The 7700K also left a bad taste in our mouth. After releasing it in early 2017 for $340 US on the LJ1151 socket, it was effectively dead within that same year. In order to remain competitive, Intel tacked on two extra cores and released the 8700K in late 2017 for $360 US, and they did so using the same, but also completely incompatible LGA 1151 socket. This left those who invested in the 7700K with nowhere to go, while Ryzen owners can still upgrade to this very day. So in a way, the 7700K was one of the greatest traps of 2017, unleashed by Intel on its own customers. Ouch. Even today, the 7700K is still a very capable gaming processor, so not trying to take anything away from it, but as a quad core in 2019, it is starting to falter. On the other hand, I expect the first gen Ryzen 7 processors to gradually improve over the coming years as games continue to utilize, or continue to better utilize the eight core 16 thread processors. And I think that's gonna do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to hit the like button. That's much appreciated. You can subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate what we do here at Harbour Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. You will gain access to our exclusive Discord chat, monthly live streams, all that good stuff. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.